How many of you are old enough to remember the, when AIDS was a frightening thing? Well, it, it, in some ways it still is, but it doesn't have some of those same connotations that it used to have. A little 12-year-old boy back east who was uh, trying to go to school and he had AIDS. He had nothing, to, it had nothing to do with sexuality, and unfortunately we've made too many things that. And, and he had AIDS. And he's trying to go to school, and he's trying to get, he had to have, get a court order, and the people were, what? Angry with him. And angry with the parents. And fear was controlling them. When we were in Uganda in the 1990s, um, it, was a, it was sad. The number of people across Africa, moms and dads who were dying because of AIDS, and it was sadly spread because as truck drivers drove across the country, they would spread their sexuality and, and, the, and the AIDS just spread. And so I had a number of parents, moms especially, would come up and as we're getting ready to head back to the States, would you please take my child with you? Oh my. Take my child with you, why? Because I'm dying of AIDS and I want somebody to take care of them. There's a huge number of orphans across Africa that, are, that have had no parents there because the parents both died of AIDS, n numbers and numbers of them. Well, we're a, a little bit past that. We don't have some of that same stigma, particularly somebody who gets it and has nothing to do, again, with any kind of sexuality. There are all kinds of reasons why somebody might get AIDS. Well, today, though, if somebody um, was sitting next to you on an airplane and they said, I think I have Ebola, you would probably say, well, that's an interesting term. Please ex explain that term to me. And why do you think that? And how serious are you? And um, ma'am, could I have another seat <laughs> on a different plane? <laughs> Too late, you've already been exposed. We don't want you around either, right? And, and Ebola has been that, that most recent sense of fear and, um, and, and, and unfortunately, potential unkindness. Well, let me take you back a few centuries to a little bit more religiously legalistic time. To a time when people had skin disease. And if you've ever seen the, the disease of leprosy, has anyone seen leprosy? I've had the sad fortune when we crossed the Ugandan border from Kenya, we're there on the border, and, and our missionary had told us, now look, it's really important, don't give people money when they come up asking for it. In fact, you, you realize that's true even here. We actually harm people by giving them money. And if you're really going to help people, then get to know their name, find out what they really need. Build a relationship with them. But we, we harm people because, oh, well, here, here's money. And, and she said, and we were under strict orders, don't give any beggars money. So we're, we're there at the border, and I'm outside the car with her. And, and as we're standing there, there's this man comes up, and he's begging, and she gives him money. I'm like, <laughs> okay, so there's something different here. Now, if you had seen the man, what I had seen as well, the man had stubs for arms and feet. He was on his knees because he was suffering from leprosy and the leprosy had eaten away at his body parts. And so when we got back in the car and I said, um, okay, I just kind of want to understand, you said, under no circumstances do you give money, and you gave money. Yes, she said, but that's a man who has no ability to take care of himself. No ability. Leprosy is a sad kind of disease. Um, there's a, ver a variety of different forms. Some are not so bad. Um, some, you know, get just to um, maybe have white skin, you know, and dry skin. That's kind of one thing. But it gets very serious to the point that the nerve endings stop functioning. Now think about that. If your nerve endings are no longer working and you were to grab something hot, what would your normal reaction be? You go, ah, right? Okay, if your nerve endings are not working and you grab something hot, what do you do? Stand there holding on. 
And while you're holding on to it, what's happening to your hand? It's burning. Well, in addition to that, now you've got this burn that's really serious because you held on way too long. The burn's so serious that um, you need to now take care of it. Now, when you're taking care of a burn, um, you're going to do some things, right? And if that burn was to get infected, how would you know it? You'd feel it. You'd feel it. Yes, you would see some things, but, but basically it's the feeling that would cause you to look, especially if you had it wrapped up or something like that. And, and here's what happens. For the person with leprosy, they can't feel it again. So they don't feel the burning. Now they don't feel the danger that's continuing. And then the leprosy that's really serious literally starts to eat away at your body, not just because of the sores, but simply because of the disease. So let me take you to Jesus' time. Jesus has been healing people around Capernaum. He's um, now left Capernaum, um, the, the city that's right there by the Sea of Galilee. It's the place that he's been kind of calling home. And it will be the place that if there is a home for Jesus, Capernaum is his home. The Sea of Galilee is where he, he will lay his head on rocks in various places because He's no longer up at Nazareth. He's come down here and he's out in the wilderness to, to try to teach people about himself and the good news. And a man comes up to him and here you have to understand the rules. If you have leprosy, you don't just wear it by the clothing you're wearing because gonna, you're going to be pretty ratty dressed. But as you're coming within... <coughs> 50 yards or more of another person, you have to let that person know with bright lights that you are a leper. And so you start hollering if anybody is around you, I'm a leper, I'm unclean. I'm a leper, I'm unclean. How do you think kids greet somebody with that kind of announcement? So rocks get thrown at you. People run from you, and nobody is going to get near you. And here's the sad part of it, even your own family. Lepers say that one of the things that's, that's most difficult in addition to this loss of feeling is the fact that they don't get touched. Do any of you enjoy being hugged by somebody who care, you care about? enjoy that, that, even just that gentle ch touch, that pat on the back, the gentle hug, uh, an appropriate one. Well, the leper is unclean, literally untouchable. Somebody should dive in the water. That's what happened at the pool of Bethsaida when uh, the, an angel moved in the water. And so if you're sick, dive in fast. Maybe you'll get healed. I don't know. <laughs> hey, it worked in Jesus' day. <laughs> the only one who didn't get healed were the complainers who said, I can't get there soon enough. That's another story. Sorry. I'm unclean unclean. I'm a leper. I'm unclean. Can you imagine walking around that way? What about your dirty spot? I, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I forgot. This is Easter. You're all perfect people. Okay. But maybe there's some people outside here that aren't perfect people. Anna said that one of the things she wanted to get away from anger, right? So what if you had to walk around and say, I'm an angry person. I'm unclean. I'm an angry person. I'm unclean. So the problem is some of us are doing that. We're just not saying it with words. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, we do this to some extent, don't we, in some of the 12-step programs? We'll go to a 12-step program like Alcoholics Anonymous, and we'll say, I'm an alcoholic. Now, if you go to Celebrate Recovery, you'll say it's slightly different. I'm a Christian who's had a battle with alcohol, or whatever it might be. But see, because the, the challenge is, is that some of us are walking around carrying a name on us. Oh, we don't say it out loud, but we say it all over the place. I'm unforgiven. Still remember, 
but I did wrong. I made mistakes and may never be able to get past those mistakes. Um, what's your uncleanness? Because Jesus has this man come to him. Let's look at it um, in Mark chapter 1. And we're trying to learn here how to be a follower of Jesus Christ. The, f- the word we use is how to be a disciple, a student, a learner who is following Jesus with their life with their, and their lifestyle. And and Jesus gave us that command, literally, it's a command. He says, as you're going out into all the world, you're supposed to make disciples, learners, followers, people who are going to become like Jesus Christ. That's our job. If you know Jesus, you have one job, and that's to help other people become like Jesus, period. So in Mark, we're now trying to look and understand, so what does it mean to really be a follower? So Mark 1, verse 40. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees. If you are willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cured. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. Jesus hears this man coming up to him, and the man says, I'm unclean. He literally is down on his knees. And I I keep picturing this man standing there at the border of Uganda and Kenya on his knees because he had no feet. He's on his knees in front of Jesus. And, and, And so imagine what it's taken for him to get to Jesus. He's had to walk up from 50 yards or more away, hollering, I'm unclean, I'm a leper. Jesus, I'm unclean, I'm a leper. I'm unclean, you can't touch me. You're not allowed to come near me. I'm unclean, but I've got to come to you. And he maybe comes running, and he's still hollering this out. And the people are scattering, and everyone's getting afraid, except Jesus stays there. And the man comes and falls down on his knees and says, I'm unclean, I'm a leper, but Jesus, if you will, you can heal me. What Jesus does next is medically dangerous. while the man is still a leper. He reaches out. And what does he do? He touches him. Jesus, I'm begging you. I want to be clean, and I believe you could do it. And if you want, you can make me clean, Jesus. And Jesus reaches out and touches him. Jesus does for this man what this man needs more in some ways than even the physical healing. Because this is a man that is so unworthy. He's not allowed around anybody. The pain is so deep and intense. We're talking about a lot worse than the physical pain he's had from the leprosy. I am nothing in this community. I'm not allowed in it. I have to scrounge for food away from everybody. I'm not allowed to be by a human being. I'm so worthless. I have no value. But Jesus, if you want, you can make me clean. And Jesus says, I want to do something more than that. I want to touch you. I want you to know how special you are. I want you to know how valuable you are. 
I want you to know how much you mean to me. And so before I do that, because I want to do that, but before I do that, let me touch you. Oh my. You imagine what that touch felt like? What did it feel like to be touched by Jesus when you'd been untouchable and you know that right now, with that touch, Jesus has just become unclean. Not only has Jesus become unclean, but he's become probably a leper himself. It was the doctor who was working in the leper, leper's colony some years back. And he always addressed the lepers uh, with Bible study and devotional until one morning he came up and he stood in front of them and he'd been serving them for something like 10 years. And then he stood in front of the group and he says, my fellow lepers, this morning I want to talk to you about the love of Jesus Christ. Did you hear what I said? (laughs) My fellow lepers. He crossed over. He moved from being the doctor who's trying to take care of them to a fellow leper like them, but still there to show them the love of Jesus Christ. Jesus touches this man, and for all we know, and for all anyone understood in those days, was now going to be a leper as well. But he says, I want to. I want to touch you. And the, and the scripture gives us an interesting word there, and the word is the word compassion. Incidentally, do any of you have the newer NIV? I need to test this one. You got the newer one? Oh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll give you what the new NIV says in a moment, but I'm just kind of trying to see. Because the word that, that our NIV has is filled, verse 41, filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And what happened? Immediately, the leprosy left him and he was cured. The word here that Jesus used, that, the, that Mark uses is that Jesus had compassion. Jesus was, and this is the same word that Jesus uses more than once. He comes back from being out on the lake and he sees a crowd of people there and they're, they're all hungry and they're wanting to be healed. And, and, and the scripture says in Matthew chapter 14 that Jesus landed, he saw a large crowd and he was filled with compassion. Mark, Matthew 15, Jesus calls his disciples together and he says, I have compassion for these people. They've been with me here for three days. They're all hungry. What are we going to do for them, guys? And, and he'll feed them and the multitude with just a couple of fish and a few bread loaves. Matthew 20, Jesus saw the blind men. He looks at him. It says he had compassion on him and he heals him. A little boy keeps throwing himself into a fire. Dad says, Jesus, take pity on us. The word Have compassion on us, Jesus. I can't watch my son do this anymore. It's killing me as it kills him. Have compassion. Your disciples couldn't set him free from this demon that's controlling him. Have compassion. Have pity. Be concerned for us, Jesus. The woman who who has been unclean for decades, doctors unable to help her, and in the middle of a crowd, she tries to sneak up and just reach out and thinking, okay, I can't let anyone know because frankly, I'm supposed to be saying unclean too. Silently, she reaches for the hem of his robe, touches it and backs away and quickly moves out of the crowd. And Jesus, as she's pulling away, says, who touched me? (laughs) Okay, uh, the disciples are like, uh, uh, Jesus, (laughs) middle of a crowd, bunch of people around you. You've been touched a whole bunch of times now. What are you talking about? He says, no, 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 no. No, somebody touched me with faith, and I felt the power move out on me. And he turns to this woman, and he recognizes her, and he says, he has 
compassion for her. It's Jesus on the beginning of Holy Week, riding on that donkey, coming in peace, and yet as a king, coming into Jerusalem, and as he's coming down the hillside there from the Mount of Olives, as he's traversing the little street ways down, he, he's looking across Jerusalem, and he stops the band. And, and there's all kinds of people that are heading into Jerusalem, and this place is packed out, okay? It's, it's one of the high and holiest days for Israel, and so thousands are literally filling up Jerusalem, and, and Jesus is with them, and they're the ones that are crying out, Hosanna, save us. Uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and they're celebrating who he is, and he stops, and he looks out over Jerusalem, and he begins to cry. And so he looks at Jerusalem and he says, how often I've wanted to pull you under my wing like a mother hen. He has compassion on them. Another place it says that he refers to them as a sh sheep without a shepherd. And anyone knows sheep are dumb and don't know how to take care of themselves. Did you know that? They, 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 cannot, they cannot take care. They have to have a shepherd. Somebody who's going to feed them, get them to water, and, and take care of them. Without the shepherd, they're going to go bad. And they're going to die. And Jesus looks and says, look at the people. They're sheep without a shepherd. And he had compassion on them. And he hangs on the cross. And a thief next to him deserves to die for all the things that he's done wrong. And he turns to him and he says, Jesus, have mercy on me. Remember me. And Jesus says, uh, he has compassion on him. And he says, today... Today, this very day, this, this day, today, when we die, you will be with me in paradise. Jesus had compassion. He's a man with leprosy. And Jesus touches him. And what happens? It says he cleans him. And he takes away the leprosy. And now what? Now he says, okay, okay, now uh, you need to be kind of chilled out here, okay? You know, you're a little bit overexcited, so here's what I want you to do. You realize there's three different offerings you have to make. There's four bathings that you have to go through. You're going to have to go through the mikvah several times, but that's after you start your offerings. you got to go to the priest, bring an offering, and the first offering, and there's going to be a dove, and because this guy's going to be poor anyway, so you're going to have to kill the dove, and you're going to have to pour out blood for you, and then you're going to have to go back and go, get, take a bath, and you're going to back in and take, give another sacrifice. You're going to go back to the mikvah, and you have another bath, and you're going to come back in and give another sacrifice. And, and if after all this, we say, there's no leprosy? Okay, then you get to come back to town. I mean, there's a huge process. And, and it's interesting. Jesus says, you need to go do it. Why? Because Jesus wants the religious people to know that Jesus has healed this man. And he wants him to go through the right steps for another reason. Because Jesus understands that this man's going to continue to be an outcast unless he goes through the proper cleansing for the community. He's got to deal with this community. He's got to hopefully now get the chance to live back in this community so he can't just say, well, I'm clean. <laughs> no, he has to go through the proper steps to do that. Well, here's the interesting thing. In the new NIV, it doesn't use the word Jesus had compassion. The word translated in the new NIV is he was indignant. Indignant. I got to confess to you that I was indignant when I saw that. Like, who's messing with the Bible? You know, Jesus was a compassionate God. He cared about people. He loved them. He's showing tenderness. What are they doing putting indignant in there? But then think about it. What is the indignant part of it? Jesus was indignant about the religious stuff that this man had to go through. The legalism that this man would have to go to in order to be accepted again. And so he's indignant. And that's why he says to the man, you got to go through the stuff. You got to go through the right steps. You got to get clean several times. You got to make several sacrifices. And then if they confirm it, you'll be clean. And then you'll be welcomed again. Jesus wants him to be welcomed. Jesus wants him to be free. Jesus wants him to take that name of unclean and to totally get rid of it. And that's what Jesus wants for you and I. That's what Easter's about, isn't it, folks? 
that God himself comes in and he is indignant about sin. And he's indignant about the things that are holding us in bondage and keeping us as slaves and the labels we're using for ourselves, the names we're calling ourselves, the sins we're remembering, the weaknesses, the shortcomings, all those negative stuff. He's indignant about that because evil wants to keep you trapped into it. And Jesus said, look, I died to set you free. The resurrection is about Jesus giving us life. It's about Jesus making us into new people. It's about Jesus making us brand new individuals. It's about Jesus saying, I'm giving you a new name. No longer do I call you unclean, but now I call you forgiven. Forgiven. Loved. Blessed. No longer do I call you angry, but I call you special mama. <laughs> I call you woman of love and peace because I set you free. Folks, Easter, Easter, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is what makes us into brand new people. And you know what? The water's still there <laughs> to say what Jesus wants to do for you. So, he died to make us clean. But what's making you unclean? What in your life right now are you holding on to that God's saying, get rid of it. I want to touch you and take that away. I want that leprosy that you're continuing to use there as that negative thing in your life. I want you to throw it away because I've cleansed it and I've died for it. I want to touch you and set you free. What is it that's making you unclean? Is it the way dad treated you when you were a kid? Is it, is it something you've done? <laughs> Some habit? Oh, <laughs> habit. Some behavior that, oh my goodness, it's a mess. Some addiction. Is it that divorce that you still feel bad about? Is it somebody you've, you've stolen from? You got out of prison, but you still feel like a prisoner inside. What is it that God wants to forgive? Because he's both indignant with that which wants to keep you in bondage. And he's compassionate because he loves you. Let's pray. <clears throat> You were despised and rejected by man, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hid their faces, you were despised. And you, God, were held in low esteem. Surely you took up our pain, you bore our suffering, yet... We considered you punished by God, stricken and afflicted. You were pierced for our transgressions. You were crushed for our iniquities, our sin. The punishment that gave us peace was put on you so that your wounds would heal us. God, we are like sheep. We've gone astray. We each turn to do our own thing and go our own way. And as we've done that, the Lord has laid on you, Jesus, the iniquity, the sins, the imperfections, the leprosy of us all. You were oppressed and afflicted. Yet you remain silent. You were like a lamb taken to the slaughter. And just like the sheep are 
dumb before their shearers, so you did not open your mouth. You were taken by oppression and judged unfairly. Yet who of us protested? You've been, you were cut off from the land of the living. Because of our sins, you were punished. You were assigned a grave with the wicked and the rich in your death, though you had done nothing wrong. There was not even any deceit in your mouth. Yet God, the, God, it was your will to crush him, to cause him to suffer, and through him to make an offering for our sin. You promised that you would prolong his days, that you would prosper his hand, and that after he had suffered, he would see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge and by his righteousness. He bore our sins. Therefore, God, we will give Jesus Christ the portion among the great. We will acknowledge his strength because he poured out his life to death and was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many and has made intercession for <coughs> our sins. Jesus, today, we are here and we are unclean. And we want your touch. In Jesus' name.